Alrighty y'all, today we're taking a look at another astronomy lecture, and today we're going to be talking about Kepler's laws. Alright, so the easiest place to start, start at the beginning, we're going to start with Kepler's first law. Alright, so Kepler's first law says the planets orbit the sun in an ellipse, with the sun at one of the focuses of the ellipse, or foci. Alright, and an ellipse has two foci, they lie along the long axis of an ellipse. And they're closer to the center for ellipses that are less eccentric, and nearer the edges for ellipses that are more eccentric. Right? So eccentricity is essentially just a measure measure of how stretched out are ellipses. Right? So if I look at my circles and ellipses down here, this is going to be super eccentric, super duper stretched out. This is going to be a little bit less stretched out. This was my perfect circle, right? So now what I'm going to do is we're going to look at these four orbits and figure out which two of them have two possible locations for the sun. One of them has only one possible location for the sun, and one of them is not a possible shape for a planet's orbit. Uh, so I kind of spoiled it already, but right, this is going to be our most eccentric one. This one's a little bit less eccentric, and this is our perfect circle. So an eccentric ellipse has the foci on our center axis and they're kind of closer to the edges right maybe not that far out but whatever the, I'm making the point they're closer to the outside and this one this one this ellipse is much less stretched out so there's my center axis my foci are gonna be much much closer together towards the center of that line. And as my eccentricity keeps decreasing as I go, right? Larger eccentricity, less eccentricity. A circle has zero eccentricity. So it only has one focus in the center of the circle. So as a super eccentric ellipse, if we started with this, as it gets smushed together, pushing the edges, as it gets smushed closer and closer towards a circle, the foci get pushed closer and closer together until it's just the one focus in the center. Okay. I kind of spoiled it a bit because these are my uh, three different uh, ellipses and circles and stuff. So these are my three possible orbits. This one, this one's not an ellipse. It kind of looks more like a rectangle with a couple of semicircles attached. Right? Like the shape of a track around a high school football field or something. Right? Even though our ellipses get a little bit more stretched out and stuff, they're still rounded around the whole top. They don't have this flat part here. And so this one doesn't have foci in the same way that our ellipses do. So there's no spot for us to place our possible, possibly place the sun, right? Because the sun is at one of our foci focuses. Right? So I said our eccentricity of a circle is zero. And then our eccentricity of an ellipse is between 0 and 1, right? So as we get closer to 1, we're getting more and more stretched out. As we're getting closer to 0, we're getting closer and closer to a perfect circle, right? And I spoiled it a little bit. Which one has 0 eccentricity? That's our circle. Which one has the highest eccentricity? Which one is the most stretched out? This one here. All right, and then we move on to Kepler's second law. So Kepler's second law states that an imaginary line between the sun and a planet sweeps out an equal amount of area in an equal amount of time. Right? So if we're saying Earth's orbit is this perfect circle, we're going to start, we're going to shade in the region that the imaginary line between Earth and the sun sweeps out during January. Well, I don't do very well with imaginary lines, so I'm just going to go ahead and draw it for us. Here's my line at the beginning of January. And if I take that, and if I follow the way Earth would rotate orbit around the sun, there's February 1st, that's the end of January, so that's where it ends. So I get this kind of piece of pie here. A nice slice of pie. There's our orbit, right? That's the area swept out during the month of January. And right, now we're going to do the same thing for September. This one in red. Let's start September 1st, and I take it, and I 
sweep it around until I get to October. And that's the end of September. So then I have this here piece of pie. Right? And now we have to answer, does Earth follow Kepler's second law? All right, so let's figure it out. Does, does it follow a second law? We know it has to be an equal amount of area swept out in an equal amount of time. Well, January and September are both one month, right? And if I'm dividing my year into 12 equal slices, I can say that every time one month passes, I'm going one twelfth of my total area of my orbit, right? That was gross. Right? I go one twelfth area swept out there, and another one twelfth area, twelfth of my total area swept down that one, right? So you said it was equal time, and it's equal area swept out. So yes, in this, in our example up here, Earth follows Kepler's second law. It works out great. How do we know? We colored it in and they look like they're the same area as well, right? We think of it like a triangle too. You can do the same kind of thing. All right, so planetary motion in terms of our area swept out, but we can also think about our speed of Earth's motion. So how is it moving? Is Earth moving faster in January or September or neither? Is it moving the same or whatever? What's the relative speed, right? So like we said before, it goes one twelfth of the area. But again, in that same time, it's going to go one twelfth of my circumference. So again, if it's one month, same time, and they're each going one twelfth of the cir total circumference, it's going to be going the same distance in the same amount of time. So it's going to be going the same speed in January and September. How do we know? Because we're super smart. Okay. And now we're going to look at a different planet with a slightly more eccentric orbit. So the first thing we're going to do for this planet is we're going to do the same thing that we did for Earth. We're going to sweep out. Uh, we're going to shade in the area that uh, the line would sweep out during January. So this one I'm going to do in pink. All right. And I draw the line and I follow the orbit around until I get to there. And now I color it in pink. Nice. Right. So I shaded in that area that it sweeps out. And now we need to find two other points during which the line connecting the planet to the sun would sweep out approximately the same area. All right, so if we're just going to eyeball this, right, we're a lot further away over here. All right. If I say this is some kind of triangle, right, it's a lot taller. Right? If I want a triangle looking like over here to have the same area, it's going to be a lot shorter right? because the sun's a lot closer on this side. So if I have a super tall triangle, my area is going to have a shorter base to have the same area as a shorter triangle as a wider base. I think I said that a little backwards, <laughs> but uh, essentially, right? As my triangle is going to get shorter, my piece of my pie, I estimate it just with a triangle. If it's going to be shorter over here, right, I can draw it and do the side in purple. And we'll start from A, whatever. Right? My triangle goes to, say, here, right? I sweep it all the way around, right? Not quite a triangle, but we can pretend it's pretty close, right? This one's taller and skinnier, so this one's a little bit shorter and wider, so that they have a, generally the same kind of area. It's a rough estimation, but really we're just trying to demonstrate that when it's further away, right, we need a skinnier base to have the same area as when it's closer, and it needs a wider base. Right? So if the sun moves from point A to point E, maybe... It would sweep out approximately the same area as it would in the month of January. Right? So again, 
area is if we're cover coloring it with ink, we use approximately the same amount of ink. All right, that looks like about the same amount of highlighter that I used. So then we're asked, does our motion that we just colored in over here, does it take more than, less than, or exactly one month? All right, so we said that these two are approximately the same area, and we know that this is a month, all right? January is just one month. So if these are the same area, and we're following Kepler's law, it says that it's going to be the same area in the same amount of time. So if we're saying they're the same area, and this is one month, that means A to E also has to be exactly one month. All right? Again, it's a rough approximation, so we'll just put a little tilde there and say mm, almost exactly one month. Because again, we're just guessing, but we're just trying to make the point of what it might look like. All right? And does the planet cover more distance during January or during the portion that we highlighted on the left? All right? So does it cover more distance during January than it does over here? Well, I kind of mentioned this when I was talking about our triangles that we were setting up. This one has a skinnier base. All right? I can see it's kind of covering a shorter distance during this section. And over here, when I had to make the base a lot wider so that I could get the same area. So it's going to cover more distance on this side than it is during January. So does the planet cover more distance during January or during the highlighted portion? It's going to cover more distance during my highlighted portion, right? We can look at, we can just see like this, but even if we did like math out to figure out the circumference of the circle, right? We don't have to do a math. We can just look at it for this one. We're just eyeballing it. We're just figuring out the general like rules and patterns of Kepler's laws. Right? And does the planet travel faster during January or during the motion on the left, right? So again, we know our speed that we're traveling at, that's distance per time, right? So we know we have approximately the same time during both of these, right? It's supposed to be exactly a month. And I already said that we're covering more distance in our highlighted portion. If we're covering more distance in the same amount of time, that means we're going to be going a lot faster over here than we are over here, right? So we're going to go faster during our highlighted motion on the left, right? More distance in the same amount of time means we're going faster, right? So now we get to talk about our real planets, right? We've just been doing some estimations thus far off of some, off of like Earth in a perfect circle and uh, some imaginary planet with whatever this is, some orbit like this. All right, but now we have some real planets and some real eccentricities, all right? So perihelion, aphelion, I can't pronounce them. I'm going to call it a P and A, you know, it works out. Uh, so we now have to figure out which planet changes speed by the largest fraction, all right? So we were just talking about how when we're closer to the sun, we need a wider base for our triangle, so we're going to go faster. And when we're further away from the sun, we need the shorter base for our triangle to get that same area, so we're going to go slower. Right? So we're looking at what changes speed by the largest fraction. If our speed is dependent on how close we are to the sun... We should get some ratios of them, right? Fortunately, the eccentricity kind of does that for us. The eccentricity gives us a measure of how, remember, it's a measure of how stretched out our circle is. Stretched out our circle, stretched out our ellipse is, right? So a super stretched out ellipse with the sun all the way over here, and the planet gets really close on one side, and it's really far away on the other. So it's going to be a huge difference in the speed that it's going around. But a perfect circle isn't really gonna change speed much, isn't really, isn't gonna change speed at all because it's going around the same speed the whole time. It never gets closer or further away. So the larger eccentricity 
is going to be our largest change in speed, our, our largest fractional change in speed over the course of our orbit. So our largest eccentricity is this one, which is Mercury. Mercury is our big winner. Right? And which one changes speed by the smallest fraction? Well, we can do use our same logic for this one. Say we said our largest eccentricity gave us the largest change in speed. Our smallest eccentricity is going to give us our smallest change in speed. By, by our smart, smallest change, fractional change in speed. Right? For this one, our lowest eccentricity. I'm not using purple. I'm going to use green. Right? It's going to be this one which gives us Venus. So Venus is our other big winner for this. All right. All right. These were Kepler's first and second laws. Uh, we're going to go into Kepler's third law a little bit more in lab. Uh, but either way, I hope you found this video at least a little bit helpful. Uh, let me know if you have any more questions about this uh, or anything else that you want me to try to explain. And I'll do my best to try to explain it because I guess Sydney explains stuff.